So brilliant, we've got quite a few of you in here, so we will make a start. Good afternoon, welcome to everybody and welcome to Martha and Helen from Mabel Therapy. I've known Martha for quite a few years now, so I'm delighted that she agreed to uh, do a session with us this afternoon. I'm going to pass over to them, I'm going to let them talk about themselves, talk about their service, but also to give you a bit of a presentation on SCMH and SALT, is that right? I hope I've got it right. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for joining us uh, for the webinar. I know how busy you all must be, especially at this time of year. So we really appreciate you making the time for this and we hope um, that it's going to be a really interesting um, topic for everybody. Um, so just to make sure everybody's in the right place, um, we're going to be discussing the link between mental health and SEM, but specifically SLCN, so speech language communication needs um, in this presentation. It's really geared towards obviously SENCOs, um, but everybody is welcome, pastoral, SLT, um, and anyone interested in, in the topic. Um, and we're going to be covering three main areas. So those are identification, so recognising the link um, between mental health issues and speech and language difficulties um, and sort of different a little bit into differential diagnosis and misdiagnosis and, and kind of what to look for um, when, when you're identifying need. Um, training and support, so things that are out there um, that can that can support you and that you can look into probably follow following this webinar um, and how to kind of develop a more comprehensive framework to go from like identification to you know into a, a graduated approach to supporting those children and then obviously like specialist intervention so at what point do you um refer onwards to an external agency for example so we're going to kind of look at those three areas um, but before we do, hello, uh, nice to meet you. I, I'm Martha Curry, as, as Abigail said, and I'm the founder of Mabel Therapy and um, I'm also a speech and language therapist by background. Uh, so I, I sort of qualified a long time ago now, I can't even remember, I should have written that down. Um, but I, I specialise in um, neurodevelopmental disorders and hearing impairment. Um, and yeah, I've been doing it for, for a long time. Um, so I'll just give you a brief introduction to Mabel. I don't want to kind of pitch at you madly here, but I just want to give you a little bit of context to who we are. Um, so we started the company back in 2015. I was working as a, a speech therapist for the NHS. Uh, and over time, I sort of noticed myself doing less and less therapy. Um, and I saw the services moving to a more consultative approach um, and putting more of the responsibility on education staff. Um, uh, I could see that there are a high number of children in need, and I feel like that has just increased over the years. Um, many were being discharged after um, what, what public service is called an episode of care. Um, and then there would be lots of children kind of stuck in that cycle of referral discharge for either not meeting the, the threshold for um, acceptance to the service or perhaps parents wouldn't be able to to attend a clinic appointment and then you'd kind of have to go through the whole um, the whole system again. So obviously um, there are very long waiting lists for care uh, and even when children reach the top of that as I say the threshold for support was so high that many children were just referred back to school. Um, and yeah, I, I guess as, as a speech therapist working in that system, I didn't feel like I was doing what I wanted to be doing. Um, and so that prompted the creation of Mabel. Um, and we'll talk to you more about how we kind of overcome these issues. But for now, I would like to introduce you to Helen Spires. She's our head of counselling. Um, so over to you, Helen. Hello, hi everybody. So yeah, I'm Helen Spires, Head of Counselling at Mabel Therapy. Um, a little bit of background about me is I've been a counsellor before starting at Mabel and, and you know taking over running the service. I was a schools counsellor, primary schools, secondary schools, um, uh, colleges. And before that, I was a primary school teacher for lots of years. So I always feel like I'm amongst friends when I um, when we deliver this training. 
Um, so to start with, I'll talk to you a little bit. Obviously, the trainings on the connection between mental health and communication issues. So I'll talk to you a little bit about things from my point of view and how it's been for the last couple of years um, overseeing Mabel's counselling service and the school service. Um, so before COVID, one in six children had a probable um, mental health issue. And we know that that's gone up in the last um, the last two years. We know that that's been uh, become much more problematic and we're expecting those stats to go up uh, much, much higher. Um, and that kind of coincided with um, with uh, during covid certainly at the start with all the services closing down or being on a running a really really limited service so there was lots and lots of young people lots of new young people that were struggling with their mental health um and and not being able to to find that support um and thankfully we're delighted that children are back in school now and they're getting the they're getting picked up and they're getting the support they need hopefully for mental health um, but we know that what lots of schools are doing is they're turning to CAMS and CAMS are overwhelmed. We know that just one in three um, children and young people with a diagnosable mental health condition are getting access to CAMS treatment. We know that three quarters of parents said that their children's mental health had deteriorated while waiting for support from CAMS. And a similar statistic, around 75% of young people experiencing a mental health problem um, felt that they waited so long that their condition got worse. So like I said, we're delighted to see children back in school with the role models they need, with those people that understand safeguarding, that are looking out for them. Um, but there's lots and lots of issues and there's lots of backlog. And so what we're finding is that a lot of schools are coming straight to us. There's some of them will come to us whilst they're waiting for CAMS, but others are just bypassing CAMS completely and, and just coming to us um, to get some mental health support. So lots of the issues we're seeing are things like um, anxiety, obviously under that umbrella of anxiety, there's social anxiety, which is understandable. I think we've all got a little bit of that nowadays, haven't we? We've all forgotten how to go out, how to have a conversation, how to make small talk. So for children who were working, you know, were uh, working from home, learning from home. Um, they, for them, it's been particularly difficult. Um, health anxiety, again, for the same reasons. The messaging in the world was that what a scary place the world is, not to con come into contact with each other. And now to go back into a busy classroom, it, it's really difficult. Trauma um, is obviously connected with COVID or just generally, um, you know, for lots of different reasons, trauma comes through our service a lot. We get children with depression, um, bereavement or loss. And obviously that's been um, heightened because of the pandemic as well. Um, bereavement for obvious reasons, but loss, I think, effect has affected every single child out there, even if it's they lost going on, you know, family holiday, the trip of a lifetime, or they lost out on having their birthday party or, you know, whatever it is. I think that everyone struggled with with loss and, and may need help with coming to terms with that. Um, school phobia. You're probably seeing that we've seen such a huge increase in a school phobia, uh, sometimes known as school refusal as well, with children unable to, to come in. And again, separation anxiety as well. I know has been been a really, really tricky one. Um, lots of children having to be peeled away from their parents at the school gate because they've, you know, they've really struggled with with making that return to school. Oh, sorry, I was in, I'm always engrossed when you're speaking, <laughs> Helen. You've got such a, like a lovely tone. Um, but yeah, so we're, we're going to talk about the link. And I think, you know, many of you will know like how those um, you know, mental health presentations are affecting all pupils, but, um, you know, perhaps more significantly are, are pupils with SEN. Um, and it's something, you know, that we, we may able to talk about a lot because these are our two services. We have a mental health service, a speech and language service. Um, and we really think it's something that's not discussed nearly enough. Um, and as a speech therapist, I always had, you know, an idea about the impact of, um, you know, having a communication difficulty on a child's mental health, like if they weren't understood by others, they could often get frustrated and that might lead to, um, you know, a lower self-esteem or it might lead to anger or behavioural issues. And and that is something that we saw a lot. Um, and I think by 
becoming clinical director of a counselling service as well, it's really opened my eyes to how much overlap there is um, and yet how little uh, that's recognised and talked about. And, and yeah, it's something we discuss a lot in the office, isn't it, Helen? Yeah, it is. And I find it really, really fascinating. And I actually think like you were saying that um, you had some awareness of the mental health implications of having communication needs. And I think that the speech and language therapists are better. I think there's still a lot, you know, there's still a lot of to be done in the two different disciplines about educating each other. Um, but I think speech therapists are probably slightly more aware than counsellors. It's only since I started working for a speech and language company where I really realised the impact of communication um, and communication needs on mental health. And I know there's some stats that Martha shares Ooh. and they always completely blow my mind and it, they always really get me thinking. Yeah, and, you know, rather appropriately, here is my stat slide. Um, yeah, so the statistics are, and this, these are, I can give you the references for these if, if you if you would like them. Um, the first one came from a study from the Royal College of Speech and Language Therapists, and it says that 81% of pupils with SEMH um, have an underlying uh, communication need uh, that requires some sort of intervention. Um, that... I mean, it's a high statistic. Um, I don't know if that surprises any of you or not, or if that feels about right. Um, but the more sort of shocking thing for, for me, I guess, is that only 12% of pupils with SEMH have ever had an assessment for speech and language. So that is the thing that we want to change. That's the thing that we want to kind of, you know, pioneer a little bit and, and think about those pupils that have SEMH and whether there could be something that's underlying it that is manifesting in um, a kind of mental health or emotional difficulty. So that's really, really important to us as a company and something we want to kind of get more schools aware of. Um, and then obviously, you know, th this final statistic came from um, a study in Bradford, I believe, but 74% of the young offenders um, in their institution have a speech language and communication need. And of course, that's at the that's at the, the top end. But it's also very interesting how these things can develop over time. Um, it's it's always that last one that make it still gives me goosebumps I've seen it so many times but it I think the reason is it makes me think about the children that I've worked with as a counsellor and as a teacher as well and I've got lots of colleagues that work as counsellors in places you know working with young offenders and it makes me think just about what might be being missed because if I was a counsellor that was working with young offenders and I didn't know I hadn't worked with you I don't think I'd be saying oh have we considered speech and language here is this something that we've you know we need to take a look at and the same as a teacher there's so many children that were you know had behavioural issues and I don't know particularly I think as they get higher up and they go into secondary schools I don't know if that's people's first port of call when I don't know if that's what, always what teachers are going to I, yeah. I know that I wasn't you you just think oh well they need counselling look at them they're they're having difficulty and I want to support them give them some counselling and actually it's it just makes me think about all those children that I've worked with in the past yeah and sometimes it's about um we do quite a lot of work around accessing the counselling because you have to have yeah. um you know the, those basic kind of I guess conversational skills because a lot of counselling is either well it's either kind of creative based art therapy or it's talking based and if it's talking based then you need to have the kind of social skills and to have a conversation which seems very obvious but it's things like um you know skills like perspective taking um empathy understanding things from other people's point of view um understanding the impact that you have on other people's behavior and also interpreting other people's behavior and so we often do quite a lot of work um around those types of things so it's like social communication before a child starts counseling because that enables them to have it or in some very i guess like um with younger children perhaps giving them the vocabulary around emotions which I know something that that's schools are really really good at that um but just giving them that kind of vocab around um how they feel and describing emotions and and that kind of stuff but yeah if, if a child had a um 
you know, a, um, a special educational need, we might do some additional work around getting those concepts really consolidated. Um, I've gone off script, haven't I, Helen? Sorry. Uh, um. <laughs> so it's important, though. I think what we're trying to get across there, or what we, yeah. you know, hopefully what's coming through is the fact that we work, our two teams work together. So we are a counselling service, we are a um, speech and language service, but actually what we're what we're really proud of is the fact that it's we don't really see it as two disciplines or we do but very much working together and we cross refer between the two the speech and language um, and the counselling team collaborate a lot and I think that what we would love to see schools doing more is kind of doing the same and I'm sure some schools are doing it brilliantly um, but sometimes when we have meetings with schools um, what they'll do is Martha and I will meet them together and we might meet the Senko and then I'll start to talk about counselling and they'll say oh well you need to talk to the head of pastoral about that I don't really get involved in that side of things or if I'm talking to the head of pastoral and Martha will say have you considered it could be a communication need and they'll say oh well, the Senko deals with all of that and mm -hmm. I think the best schools that we work with are the ones where they the Senkos are all, at all of the pastoral meetings the pastoral leader is at all of the Senko you know send meetings and they're they're kind of looking at it with that perspective as well yeah yeah absolutely I think seamless look at that so um just before you start it Gavin <laughs> sorry <laughs> just that. um so this video is from uh, the Mabel Academy it's presented by Alicia Lynch she's our head of speech and language um and it's from a uh it's from a course called the link between communication and mental health um we would like to my my ceo here has put in um mabel schools have free access to our academy so if you are in capital mm -hmm. letters so if you if you do come aboard with Mabel and want to talk to us about that, you will have free access to all of the Mabel Academy courses. They are CPD accredited and there's 18 courses on there across all areas of speech and language and, and mental health. So shameless plug, but it yeah, it was put in there, not by me. Um, so I don't want to tell you too much about this video. Um, but I want you to think about whether you recognise children like Zach from your school context and, and the kind of thing that you would put into place um, to support Jack with his learning. OK, ready. Jack is 15 years old and struggles to attend school every day. When he does make it in, he is often late, usually forgetting something such as his lunch or PE kit. Today is Wednesday and English is the first lesson. Jack sits down at his desk and immediately begins to swing back and forth on his chair. As the teacher starts to introduce the topic to the class, he spots Jack picking at a poster stuck to the top of his desk. He addresses Jack in front of the class, telling him, stop fidgeting and focus. Jack stops peeling the edges of the poster, but continues to find it difficult to sit still. His brain is trying to work out what the word focus means. Before he knows it, the teacher has finished speaking and has started to hand out worksheets. He glances around the room at his peers, picking up their pens to write, and the usual wave of anxiety creeps over him. What was it he needed to do? He tries to read the instructions on the top of the worksheet, but the words are too long and make no sense. He can feel the eyes of his classmates and the teacher burning into the back of his head, and he begins to pick at the poster again, this time more vigorously. The teacher walks over to Jack and asks him if he knows what he needs to do. He stares at the worksheet, desperately avoiding his gaze, and mumbles, yes. The teacher asks for him to explain it to him. Jack mumbles again, telling him to shut up. The teacher responds, excuse me, look at me when you're speaking. At this point, Jack kicks the chair out from underneath him, rips up the worksheet, yells and swears at the teacher. Jack is ordered to go and sit in the corridor. Once out of the classroom, his anxiety levels begin to drop and the red mist clears. OK, so it's taken from a course called The Link Between Communication and Behaviour. It's presented by our head of speech and language, Alicia. So I think there's probably a bit of a clue there at where we're directing you with this in that it's it's you know could well be a speech and language issue for Jack. But I know if I'd have had Jack in my class, I think I would have been nicer than that teacher. 
I would have been, <laughs> I, I, I hope. But um, I definitely would have gone to the pastoral leader um, and said, oh, I think Jack needs some counselling, you know, rather than going down the, the speech and language assessment route. You're on mute, Martha. It's always one. <laughs> oh, no. Um, so I was going to say, yeah, I think that happens a lot, especially once once um, they get to secondary. Um, the, the, so, you know, speech and language is very, very much in our kind of consciousness in the early years, key stage one. But once we get to key stage three, it's not the first thing often that that's thought of, perhaps. <laughs> um, I'm sure some of you do. Um, let me just share again, because I want to just show you some of the things that that we sort of take from we can take from that video. So obviously, um, you know, Jack was actually, I'm just going to fill these in. So he, obviously Jack was was late in forgetting things. So um, from a speech and language point of view, I, I would be immediately thinking um, I want to look at his executive functioning needs and whether there's any difficulty there. Um, it could also be that he has difficulty telling the time or understanding time concepts. So not just kind of, you know, reading a reading a clock or a watch, but um, all those kind of time concepts like before, after, um, tomorrow, yesterday, you would be so surprised how many kind of year, year seven to year nines that still really struggle with those ideas. Um, and obviously that's going to affect you being late and forgetting things and not being clear about about what you need to do. So swinging on a chair and fiddling, I'm sure lots of you thought this already. So could be an attention difficulty or it could be that he's um, swinging in order to um, self-soothe and he has a sensory sensory need or sensory integration need that um, hasn't been identified and that's a way that he's kind of managing that for himself. Um, so not following instructions, That's I guess that's the most obvious sort of speech language communication need that's there for Jack. So, you know, does he have a uh, limited receptive vocabulary? Has he got a poor auditory memory? Um, and so he's having difficulty retaining that verbal information. That's certainly something that we'd, we'd look at in, in the assessment. Um, not knowing what to do. So we'd want to we want to rule out sort of reading difficulties, which again would be looking at that underlying phonological awareness system. It's something again that's we go we go into in a lot of detail in early years, and then as soon as um, children get to key stage one, it's it's not taught anymore um, in that kind of formalised way. Um, and so if they don't pick it up at that stage, often they can get much further down the school without having that really solid understanding of uh, phonological awareness skills. Um, so yeah, we'd want to look at reading, visual difficulties, which obviously isn't speech therapy, but you know, we need to rule it out. Um, it could be a social communication issue. So is he unsure of the social rules for how to ask for help in the classroom? You know, does he is he nervous about standing out um, and that's causing him to just not, you know, not reach out, not ask for help? Um, so that's something that we'd want to kind of pick out as well and how confident he felt kind of speaking in front of other children and, and that kind of thing. Um, Eye contact's a huge one. I'm sure we could have a whole um, a whole course just just on eye contact. But you know, if he's avoiding eye contact, obviously we know now that's not automatically a social communication issue. It could be that he's anxious, he's self conscious. It can also be a cultural thing, um, but also it is something to consider in terms of um, social communication as well. So being rude and using swear words. This is I don't want to say a classic, but it's it's something that we see an awful lot in children that have um, a like a, a a poor expressive vocabulary. So they use words like rude words or swear words because it gets a reaction, it gets the point across, um, and it often means that they can control the conversation uh, with with aggressive language. So it's it's quite it's something again we see quite a lot with children that have expressive language difficulties, particularly. Um, but as it says here, it could again be a social thing. So not understanding what language is appropriate to use with friends and what language is appropriate to use with with teaching staff um, and understanding the kind of differences between levels of formality there. Um, and then, of course, the, the destructive behaviour. So uh, he obviously knows that throwing a chair 
will have him removed from the class, which reduces his anxiety. And that's how it kind of all comes together and, and manifests for for Jack. Um, I think this is where so, I hand over to you, Helen. I got yeah, I got into so a flow, the, but yeah, you go for it. So Martha's tied it all up in a bow, case closed. We know exactly what's going on for Jack. Ah, but do we? Because anyway. actually, ah, if you go back, if we go back even further, it could still be a mental health issue. Because if I was as with my counsellor hat on, um, I would be looking at Jack and thinking, is there an attachment issue? And so you've probably um, heard lots about attachment disorder. I know it's talked a lot about in schools nowadays. Um, and it's a really, really big part of what counsellors are doing when they're working with, with you know, all clients, but with children and young people. Um, so I'll talk you through a little bit about attachment. Um, so when we refer to attachment, we're describing the early bond that a child has with their caregiver, usually the mum. Um, and what we want is we want them to have a secure attachment. So what that means is when the baby has a need, it's met. So they cry, they're soothed, they're changed, they're fed, um, whatever it is that they need. Um, and they are getting the message, oh, the world is a safe place that will meet my needs if I, you know, if I just ask. And so they are happy, content and they grow up to feel welcome and loved in the world. Um, if a child doesn't get their needs met consistently, they learn the opposite. They learn that the world world is a scary, unreliable place and they develop an insecure attachment. Um, so insecure attachment is then broken down into different types. So there's the anxious attachment style and this is where someone would be really needy and really demanding and that's the way they find of getting their needs met from people. Um, others are avoidant so they decide that they can't rely on other people to meet their needs. So they will only rely on themselves. They'll be very closed off to other people. They'll be reluctant to have help. Um, and they may kind of seem quite cold and distant. Um, and then there's the extreme, which is that disorganised attachment, which can kind of be a combination of both. So I need you, but when you show me, you know, support, I will push you away. And for those people that have a disorganised attachment, they struggle to regulate their emotions. They struggle to read social situations accurately generally struggle to navigate uh, the world and so that's kind of very personality driven what I've talked about so this is the point when I talk to people about it where they go oh I had a boyfriend like that that's why he wouldn't commit because he had an avoidant attachment style or you know whatever it is and you're probably starting to think about yourself and the people in your family um, but it does also talk about it you know it, it has a, a deeper impact than just personality because what it means if you're going those children are going through early anxiety and they're going through toxic levels of stress um, because they're not having their needs met. So they're in survival mode. And when they're in that survival mode, those neural pathways aren't being able to do the job that children with a secure attachment are getting, which is developing things like empathy, humour, um, problem solving, language skills, the ability to communicate. So if they're not being spoken to or sung to or played with in their early childhood, if they're not getting their needs met and they're in that state of constant anxiety, um, then it will have an impact on their speech and language skills. So if we look back at Jack, it may be that he's got an insecure attachment. And so he may well need speech and language intervention and an assessment would definitely be a great call. But actually, all the speech and language support in the world may not get him feeling that kind of that sense of being OK in the world and reducing that anxiety. So we would need to be looking at that as well. Yeah. And I think... Am I, am I muted? No. No, you're all so, good. OK, excellent. Um, so obviously, Jack, the example was very sort of behaviour focused, um, I guess, because maybe maybe because that's a, a client group that we work with quite often. But obviously, you know, there are other mental health presentations, particularly like anxiety um, that we see in in the children that have communication needs so that often comes along with um special educational needs as well we see a, a huge rise in anxiety with for children with um with SEN particularly well I wouldn't even say particularly but I was thinking particularly social social communication issues um and it's it, you know it's lots I know that we've had a lot of referrals for your team Helen for for um young people that have a diagnosis of, of ASD um mm -hmm. 
for for the school phobia or for anxiety which is just yeah it's it's crazy what's what's happening at the moment um but whatever it is i think yeah i think that the key is to have a holistic look at it and to to know what's going find out what's going on for them in terms of both their mental health and communication and kind of thinking about what's the best approach for that young person at that time and um it's i guess it's your job as as um senior leaders as, as senkos to Make sure your staff are supported and they know what to do and how they can help um, the students as they go through. So, Helen, what can we do? Oh, good question, Mark. <laughs> Thanks for asking. Um, so, yeah, so at Mabel, we talk about the three pillars of inclusion. And so that is identification of the issue, training around the issue and then specialist support as well. Um, so if we look at identification first um, and we talked about it earlier, but I def think definitely the most important aspect of identifying a communication or mental health issue is making sure that the two disciplines are talking. So your Senko might be about to refer someone for speech and language because they're struggling with their social communication. It, when in fact, if you spoke to someone who, from the pastoral side or someone that's supporting them emotionally, they might be able to tell you about early trauma or early abuse that they've been through that could have had a massive impact on, on how they're communicating. And that's really, really crucial information when you're making that referral. Um, it's also, it's not very exciting, but it's very, I think it's so important if to just have policies in place, to have it, you know, at that kind of, that, that real, um, what's the word I'm looking for, structural level, that the policies are in place to make sure that things are things are being looked at. And if you don't have a mental health policy, I would really, really encourage that. And in a mental health um, policy, I would encourage priority number one, staff well-being. Um, staff set the emotional temperature for the schools. So if they are highly anxious, if they're highly stressed, um, if they're not getting a good work life balance, all of those things, the students will be feeding off that and it will just there will be a general tone of kind of unease and anxiety. So that's priority number one. Um, having mental health first aiders who are specifically trained to support students in crisis, um, students being able to self report if they're struggling. Um, so and really communicating how they can do that. Um, having a student led mental health council will give you such an immediate insight into the mental health issues for your students that we as adults probably don't have as much of a grasp on as we think we do. If you ask the students, they will tell you what's going on. Um, teaching mental health proactively in school um, and making sure that I know PSHE always dropped off of my timetable in primary school if I, you know, if I hadn't done maths or if I hadn't done English, but just really giving it that status it deserves and making sure that it's it stays on the timetable. Um, having safe spaces around the school that students can go if they are struggling at school, if they have got school phobia or social anxiety or all of those things, um, allowing those students as well to have flexible timetables if needed. And I talked about having mental health first aiders, but um, but actually making sure that all staff are trained in the basics of identifying mental health issues. Um, and we will talk about that in a bit more in a minute, but I've talked about having a mental health policy and how important that is. But I think we'd love it even more if it was like a mental health stroke communication policy, uh, wouldn't we, yeah. Martha? I think, yeah, just, I mean, obviously that's that's our kind of what, what mission, I guess, you know, is to to make sure that these students are assessed for communication needs as well. And um, because obviously, you know, making sure that the their needs are met and that the you know we talk about have pupils having a voice and all and um pupil opinion and all that kind of thing so we need to be doing as much as we can in order to give them that voice through um the right level of assessment the right level of intervention um and yeah and that starts with identifying those students that might be having difficulty um, and I've put sort of um, formalizing student screening in there I know lots of you will have um, screening for well-being and mental health in place already um, and there are some great um, screeners out there I know many of the primary schools I work with will use I think it's called the Wellcom um for for early years which is a great one quite time consuming but it is it is quite thorough um so it's good um i've mentioned 
uh, to Abigail that we we're gonna we do have a, a free screener that we will we will um, send to Abigail after this to to uh, disperse with you and it's a, a one page checklist you can hand out to your school staff um, they can look at the main areas of speech language communication needs there's a very quick kind of scoring system so a lot of the senkos that we work with will use it almost like a referral form um, so uh, teaching staff fill that in before they kind of make the referral to the senko and then they can talk through what the child's difficulties might be um, and then we also have like a prioritization element of it as well which looks at um, different elements so legal elements obviously you know if they are um, on a child protection plan if they have an EHCP in place then they're going to kind of move up the prioritization list um, but also things like timing so is it the right time for this child to be having this sort of intervention um, and also impact on well-being so is the communication difficulty that they have putting them at risk of being isolated is it putting is it affecting their learning obviously is it affecting uh, their self-esteem so kind of it gives you two different scores and you add them up and then you can have a priority prioritization list of who to kind of put forward for um more in-depth assessment with external agencies i've probably talked about that too much but if you're a nerd like me you will absolutely love it it's um just a nice neat little system so I'll make sure you all get a copy of that um I've, I've gone off piste again Helen you'll have well, to no, bring me it's back. all right <laughs> no because it's important but I think being able to identify um children so they kind of they're almost interchangeable the order of those two aren't they because mm. we're identifying but if we want to expect staff to identify the issues they do need to have the training and so the um and I talked about mental health first aiders and how important that was, but it is important that all staff have some general awareness. And I know when I did my teacher training, hopefully it's changed a bit now, but I don't, we did maybe a couple of afternoons on SEN. I don't think we did any mental health training at all. So, and that may be, you know, your staff at your school will have various experiences of how much, you know, support they've had and how much understanding they have of those areas. So it's, it, it's essential to, to get the CPD in place. Um, obviously, if you feel qualified and competent to do that, you can, or you can send your staff on courses. Um, but we do have the CPD Academy, don't we, Martha? We do, <laughs> we do. Um, Shameless which, plug number two. Uh, which obviously, as I say, 18 courses covers. Um, so it covers, I would say more um universal areas so things like setting up your uh classroom to support communication and there's like different checklists for um different age groups so like early years um key stage one key stage two and like what you should kind of maybe include in the classroom um if you're feeling really I wouldn't say mean, but there is like an observation checklist that you can use with your staff to to see if they're giving kind of adequate opportunities for the children to communicate and incorporating certain things into the lessons and that kind of stuff. Um, so that's something that is, yeah, that's that's actually something that we could share with you as well. I didn't think about it, but we can we can share the early years communication um, skills checklist. Uh, I think that's quite a useful one if anyone wants it. Um, and then we've got more specialist courses. So things like, um, you know, if we have like really specialist ones, like kind of if you've got a child that's starting your school and they have a hearing impairment, to be honest, most sensory needs services are pretty good at coming in and doing the training. But if, you know, if somebody misses that training or you've got a different member of staff coming in, we've got an hour long course covers all the information that they need it's split into kind of like five to ten minute modules it's video based they get a certificate at the end and yeah it goes into quite a lot of detail about how to support um, a child with hearing impairment from kind of looking after the hearing aids to what sort of activities they they um, need to be doing and where they need to be sat in the classroom that kind of thing um, other ones that are really popular are the uh, picture picture exchange um communication training that we have so it goes through the first six stages of of how to use um, a PEC system um and yeah that those ones are really popular from the speech and language point of view and I think 
counselling skills for teachers and the wellbeing one. That's that's a really good one. Did you deliver that, yeah. Helen? I did do that. Counselling yeah. skills for teachers. <laughs> thanks for remembering. Yeah. Um, and then also um, identifying mental health is kind of a lot of what we've talked about. So those so and every member of staff in your school could watch that one and it would just be so useful. Just identifying, looking for those warning signs and, and how to kind of support low level, you know, mental health needs in the classroom, you know, on on a daily basis. And I think that is the the key. That is the beauty of um, the Mabel CPD is actually it's not oh well you, we can send one member of staff to do it because that's all we can afford and then they can disseminate it back to the rest of us um, schools are with Mabel even if you've got 100 200 members of staff absolutely every single one of them will get a login and will have access to the CPD and everyone can watch it so it's actually a really nice cheap way of training staff on mass and on you know things that we clearly think are really really important um for, yeah. for every every member of staff to to learn about yeah i mean and we're obviously lucky that we have experts in the field presenting all of the modules um and yeah and you've 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 basically got the first two um pillars of inclusion covered uh with that as well um put communicating with parents on there because obviously you know they they need to be involved in the process every step of the way i feel like we've done this presentation for other groups um but i feel like you guys will be really really hot on communicating with parents yeah. so we probably don't need to talk about that too much with you guys um, but i think the cp almost all the cpd if not all talks about there's bits in it that talk about communicating with parents so if your staff yeah. are watching it are watching the cpd then it would help them to know how to have difficult conversations you know in the mm. inappropriate ways and how to support parents yeah absolutely um, um so third the third pillar knowing when to refer on and that's kind of where we come in a little bit more isn't it yeah so i suppose like you know collaborating with specialist services we'd like to think that we we are those specialist services and, and obviously you will have your own um access to to speech language services and to to the to you know counseling to educational psychology cams ot um but yeah it's it kind of leads to this so the identification is first stage training so everybody knows when to identify and then also kind of having the knowledge and skills to know when to collaborate and uh, refer on well, i think martha's going to talk a little bit more about the specifics of mabel now but i can i address the elephant in the room that hopefully isn't there which i know lots of people when we have these conversations they think they we're an online service so all of our speech and language sessions all of our counseling sessions are delivered online and actually what covid has taught us is that things can work online and the world can move online and it, and it sped that process up and so we're having a lot less difficult conversations but people are interested i think maybe particularly with the counselling I'm not sure maybe it's both and they say can it work online and what I would say is um, I mean the short answer is yes but we Martha and I have written a white paper which is on the website and it's collated tons and tons of research which was behind the development of Mabel and and you know it, it's kind of the foundations of of how Mabel's um been created and there's lots of research into teletherapy both speech and language and counseling and almost all the research shows no difference in terms of outcomes mm. the ever so there's a few that show it in more in favor of online but it's certainly there's nothing that's saying that online isn't as good as in-person therapy um, the only factor that can get in the way of it is if the um, the therapist isn't on board. So if they've been shoved on Zoom reluctantly, don't want to deliver their counselling that way, but they have to, it might not be as effective. But for our therapists who are enthusiastic, you know, kind of disciples of online therapy, <laughs> it's, um, it's, it's amazing. It's incredible. So if, you, if anyone wants to read the white paper, it's on the website and also we can send it to you. But the, the, um, the headlines are, it absolutely does work. It improves, particularly in the counselling, it improves engagement and children engage, uh, children access it quicker because it can feel quite intimidating to be in the room with a counsellor. And sometimes for some children that will put them off the idea of going and doing that. If you tell them it's online, they, they're more likely to engage with it. They generally engage for longer. Um, and so and it improves access as well because you've got access. Sorry, I'm probably stepping over Martha's point. No, now, go but for you've it. got access to um 
you know, when I was a school counsellor, I was the only one, little old me. And if I had some, you know, someone might have really needed a male counsellor or really needed a counsellor that was older than me or younger than me or, you know, has a different um, cultural background to me. And yet they were stuck with me. And we have a team where we can match. We've got, you know, at the minute we've got about 60 counsellors. So it's, it is great that you can really, really match to the needs of um, the student and even more so in speech and language when you've got those very specific specialisms I know I'll let you take over now Mark. yeah no I, no I love it no um it's yeah like you were saying it's a similar thing so you know obviously when you become a teacher um uh, you, there's a difference between when you're an NQT and when you know you guys have done lots of additional training to become SENCOs um, and it's the same for speech therapists so we start as NQTs new qualified therapists and then you you specialize in different areas like obviously I I work with hearing impaired children I work with children with um ASD but and I work with early years and key stage one don't know if that came across um through this but Give me a 15 year old stammerer and I would have to go back to my books. I'm not saying I couldn't do it, but it would be it would be sort of out of my immediate comfort zone. And I know that like obviously working in loads of primary schools and secondary schools, like the range of need is incredible. <laughs> I don't know how you guys do it a lot of the time because you know you'll have some children that have speech sound difficulties you'll have children with developmental language disorder you'll have children that have social calm um and so what we can do is give you the specialist therapist to meet all of those needs we've even we've even got um you know therapists that specialize in things like cleft palate which is really really hard to get um and on the counseling team we've got a a service that works with um foster children lack children and um obviously those with um additional needs as well which i think is quite tricky to to find sometimes so that's the benefit that's one of the main benefits of being online is we are not restricted um by by um geography you know, we've got some of the best therapists, I think, in yeah, in the country, and we we can we can we can do that because we've got um, we can recruit from anywhere. Um, as you said, like increased patient engagement. So we're not on Zoom. We we would never ask a member of staff to hold anything up to the camera or to tell us where the child was pointing. Like we've spent a long time developing the software. I'll just show you kind of some little animations for this, so you can see. That it's completely synced on both sides. Um, it's very intuitive for the children, so it's much like you know iPad games or educational games that they'll be used to playing. Um, it's facilitated by the therapist throughout. Um, but yeah, it's it's not. I was going to say it's not black sheet press, which I'm sure you have seen a lot of um, over the years. So it's just yeah, it's a bit more engaging. Um, the children room like really enjoy it you know we've worked with like well I remember particularly working with a young man um, at special school age 13 and he completely disengaged from speech therapy it was sort of not again I'm not going through this um, but he but they managed to get him to the session and he absolutely loved it because it was just you know, he'd had so much speech therapy. He was a young man with Down syndrome and, you know, he'd had speech therapy since the since birth, basically. So by the time he got to 13, he was just exhausted by it and had just opted out. But we managed to re-engage him um, and do some really lovely work with him. And it was just, yeah, it was, re I guess, really rewarding to see that we can we can kind of um, re-engage people that have that still have loads of potential to improve. So that was nice. Um, so I guess the other good thing is like we've got, you know, totally open referral process. The referral information you provide feeds into a really clever algorithm and it matches the student with the ne necessary clinical expertise to meet their needs. Um, so once you kind of make the referral, we, we gain consent from the parent via um, an email, come straight back, and then we we can book them in for an assessment. So we have roughly a 48 hour waiting time. Um, once the, the speech therapist has completed the assessment, 
session, the report will be with you within seven days and then they can start the therapy immediately after that. So it's just a much quicker process. Um, and it means that if you do have a backlog of those students that need assessment, that need support, then we can help you to kind of get get through that. Because I know a lot of schools are waiting um, at the moment for services to come in. Um, so yeah, and that's the same with counselling. You know, once the referral's made, we obviously get consent of the parents, we speak to them, we speak to you, um, and then we can get them set up straight away. We can deliver the sessions at home if that's easier. We can deliver the sessions at school. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, just a much kind of slicker, easier process for you. There's lots of reporting as well. So you can, I should, well, I can go into this if, if you're really interested, I can I can do a whole thing um, uh, with you. So do let me know if you want to kind of uh, know about it. But there's lots of kind of metrics um, that we record for you. So like budget tracking, target tracking, F, every report that we write is sent to the parents immediately after the session. So well, I say immediately, within 24 hours after a therapy session, the therapist will write a report, it's sent to Senko, class teacher, any other services involved and parents. It gives follow up activities after each session. Um, it gives a an analysis of how they're performing against their targets and you can look at kind of how much um, how much the intervention has cost and you can kind of bring a nice um, screen into your SLT meetings, governors meetings and talk through kind of um, what the children are doing in their sessions in a really easy way. Uh, so it saves you a lot of kind of admin admin time as well. Um, do you want to talk about the, the counselling? No, I think, I think yeah. I've probably talked, you know, quite a lot about how it works with the counsellors and things like that. I think what I would just want to emphasise as we finish up is just is that there's the kind of there's the two elements that I think make Mabel really special is that the platform that you can see in front of you is designed with children in mind and so it's really engaging it's set up to deliver play therapy art therapy all of those things that a counsellor would be doing in the room we can do but in a really cool engaging way because it's on a computer and that you know children love that um so it's it's really designed with children in mind and but then the the behind the scenes stuff. So the, the dashboard and the login is designed with teachers in mind. You can refer students without having to speak to anybody. You can set them all up. You can send off the consent form yourself to the parents and things like that. So if you're doing it, I mean, please don't do this, but if you're doing it on a Saturday night with a glass of wine with your laptop, on your <laughs> knee, you can do it all yourself. I mean, yeah, come on, work life balance, but we yeah. all know that we all do it. And so you can do it and you can set 10 new students up on Mabel without having to you know speak to anyone on the team go to any meetings or anything like that so it's uh I think they're kind of the 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 yeah, unique the, you know yeah. wonderful things about Mabel oh. um and obviously you know if you are interested in talking to Helen or I about the service or just to talk about specific cases in your school um, that you feel kind of meet this mental health speech therapy uh, crossover you know that would be really interesting for us you're very welcome to get in touch um, and like I say if you'd like a copy of any of the resources I'll share them with Abigail um, or the white paper is on our website so you're very again very welcome to go and kind of explore that and and uh, find out more um but yeah that's that's uh that's got, it from us that was brilliant thank you both martha and helen so we did have a couple of questions but i think i was able to answer them as we went down you've already got one person who's going to go and pitch it at their school tomorrow yay <laughs> <laughs>